In May 1967, the leaders of the Soviet Union took a step that would change the map of the Middle East. The losers would be their own allies. It all began with a false report from Soviet intelligence. Anwar Sadat, speaker of the Egyptian parliament, was in Moscow for talks with Soviet Prime Minister Kosygin. It was a routine trip. Egypt was now firmly in the Soviet camp. Sadat was seen to his plane by the deputy foreign minister. The minister took Sadat aside. He said Israeli troops were massing against Syria. He asked him to report this at once to Nasser. Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, was the hero of the Arab world. If Israel was massing troops on the Syrian border, Nasser would be expected to act. He sent for his chief of staff and instructed him to find out what the Israelis were up to. I went to the border between Syria and Israel. I found nothing unusual. So I asked to see the latest aerial photos of the border area. They showed me photos from the previous day and the day before that. I studied them, but I still found nothing. The chief of staff found nothing to back up the Soviet report. But then the Soviet ambassador came back to us. He said Soviet intelligence had reconfirmed their report. Israeli troops really were massing on the Syrian border. And the situation was very dangerous. Soviet diplomats spread the alarm throughout the region even in Israel, as the Prime Minister and his wife soon found out. It was 2.30 in the morning. A secretary came in looking sleepy. He said, the Soviet ambassador is down in the lobby. He's all dressed up, very formal, and he insists on seeing the Prime Minister right now. I said to Ashkol, let's receive him in our pajamas. Our ambassador gave Eshkol a telegram from Kosygin. Eshkol offered to go to Moscow to discuss the regional situation. The ambassador was angry. He said, you are massing your troops in the north. Eshkol said, we can go there now. We can go together to the Golan border. You'll see we haven't mobilized anything. The Soviet ambassador said, no. At that time, Soviet leaders believed that America was on the run in Vietnam. Some in the Kremlin now sought to weaken America's influence in the Middle East, even at the risk of another regional war. We believed a war could bring us political gains. Even a stalemate could bring us benefits. Egypt had our backing, both political and military. We thought their forces would demonstrate the benefits of Soviet support. So we were confident that the balance of power in the Middle East would be altered by a localized war. In Cairo, Nasser had put his armed forces on alert the moment he received the Soviet report. If Moscow's plan was to provoke a war, it seemed to be working. The Russian report escalated everything. We felt obliged to move troops into the Sinai. From there we could retaliate against Israel if Israel attacked Syria.
Abdel Nasser did not want a war with Israel. Abdel Nasser was thinking of his image in the Arab world. So he put on a show of strength using the armed forces. Marshal Amir wanted to attack Israel right away. The Arab media had been criticizing Nasser. Some countries had accused Abdul Nasser of hiding behind the United Nations. Since the Suez War of 1956, United Nations troops had provided a buffer on the border between Egypt and Israel. Now, Nasser ordered them out. The eyes of the world focused on a small harbor at the edge of the Sinai Desert, Sharm el-Sheikh. Headquarters wanted to expel the UN troops from Sharm el-Sheikh. I told them, if we do that, Egyptian troops will have to take over at Sharm el-Sheikh. We will then be obliged to close the Straits of Tehran. That will mean war. A blockade at the Straits of Tehran by Egypt could lead to war because the Straits at the foot of the Gulf of Aqaba controlled Israel's only trade route to the eastern half of the world. Nasser, in the name of Arab solidarity, was going on the offensive. Our armed forces are ready for war. The Gulf of Aqaba belongs to Egypt. There is no way that we will allow Israeli ships to pass through. The Jews are threatening war. We tell them hello and welcome. We are ready for war. But there is no way we will give up our rights to the Gulf of Aqaba. In Israel, the people prepared to defend themselves. Their prime minister, Levi Eshkol, summoned his cabinet and military commanders. I told him, until now, I was not sure what was going to happen. But after the Egyptians closed the straits, I'm sure the situation will develop into a war. The straits are a casus belli for us. And I told him firmly that this will be their end. This will be their grave. We commanders told him, we have no choice, we have to mobilize, we have to launch an attack within 72 hours. If we give the Egyptians more time, they will pack the Sinai with more and more divisions. The generals saw Israel becoming increasingly vulnerable. The chief of staff, General Rabin, was very worried, he smoked a great number of cigarettes, and he ate nearly all the, the nuts and raisins in the little basket there. And um, he was very worried because, not because he doubted the result of the war, but because uh, we were really very unprepared for war. Rabin asked Abba Iban for a diplomatic solution. Rabin had said we were really not prepared for war. And um, second, there should still be some attempt to avoid it by exercising warnings and pressures upon the Egyptians. And uh, then uh, Mr. Eshkol sent me a note saying, what are you doing here? Prime Minister Eshkol dispatched Abba Ibn to seek the help of Israel's key allies. He wanted an international fleet to keep the straits open to prevent war. I've been asked by my government to uh, explore uh, what these governments intend to do in order to reopen this international waterway to what a situation of law. What do you want the United law. States to do, sir? Well, uh, I've come here really to find out what the United States <laughs> intends to do. President Johnson made it clear that he didn't want Israel to attack first. 
the president had said to Dean Rusk and me, and I'm going to speak rather crudely, get Eban in here, into the family quarters of the White House, so we can work him over. Because we had heard that uh, the Israelis were about to preempt. They were about to attack the Egyptians. Eban talked at great length and eloquently. He always spoke eloquently and he always spoke at great length. But what he had to say was very simple. This was a mortal crisis for Israel and he wanted to know what the United States was prepared to do. The president, he simply expressed skepticism about the idea that Israel was in danger. He said, you are not in danger. You are in a very difficult situation, but you are not in peril. He said to Eban, we do not believe that Egypt is about to attack Israel. Moreover, if it does, you'll lick them. To make the point, President Johnson asked for the Defense Department's assessment of the likely outcome of a Middle East war. We had concluded that if Israel preempted, they could win clearly in a period of about uh, seven days, as I remember. We had also estimated that if they did not preempt and Egypt attacked first, that uh, it would take somewhat longer, perhaps uh, 10 to 14 days. Then the president took out a piece of paper and started reading from it as though this was some kind of a sacred text. And uh, th what this document said was, Israel will not be alone unless it decides to be alone. If you go alone, you'll stand alone. That was a very cold-blooded statement. We will not come to your defense if you preempt. We cannot come to your defense if you preempt. As Israel received its warning in the White House, an Egyptian delegation was heading towards the Kremlin. We didn't even see Moscow. We were driven in cars with the curtains drawn, straight into the Kremlin. The Egyptians were self-assured. Shams Badran exuded confidence. He said that if war came, the Egyptian military could handle it. In fact, he described the army like a wild horse raring to go. But the Soviets warned the Egyptians not to be seen as the aggressors. Prime Minister Kasigan said, tell Nasser, if he strikes first, he will escalate the conflict. He will provoke the superpowers. America will not stand aside. I said, we understand, but closing the straits isn't an attack on America. The Soviets made it clear they meant what they said. We asked about the arms contracts we had with them. We asked if they would hurry things up, especially some spare parts we needed for our planes. We could have taken them with us in a bag. They were always asking for arms. Every high-level delegation would ask for arms, including Badran. They did not refuse to supply the arms, they just claimed they had none. I was really shocked. I thought, how can our Soviet friends treat us like this? War was at our doorstep. Nasser got the message. The Soviets would back him only if he did not appear to be the aggressor. His commanders were instructed to stay on the defensive, ready to absorb an Israeli attack. The Air Force chief jumped up. He said it will be crippling. He said, Mr. President, the first strike will be crippling. He said it in English. He meant that a first strike by Israel would cripple our Air Force. The commander-in-chief told him, 
If you let them strike first, you will fight only Israel. But if you strike first, you will have to fight Israel and America. But the war fever in Cairo had become unstoppable. Popular hatred of Israel, which Nasser did nothing to discourage, now swept him forward and drove other Arab rulers to his side. Even King Hussein of Jordan, for years at odds with Nasser, decided he could no longer stand aloof. In the morning I got into my uh, aircraft and uh, I flew to Cairo. And I was met by the president. I was in uh, military fatigues uh, with my gun uh, on. And he said, well, I see you're carrying a gun. I said, I've been like that for the last few days with my troops. And then he made a strange remark. What would happen if we suddenly took you prisoner and uh, denied uh, all knowledge of your arriving in this country? Soon after, King Hussein signed a mutual defense treaty with Nasser and agreed to put his army under Egyptian command. We were on the verge of a, uh, uh, of a war. Therefore, any reservations I had uh, in the past to uh, any troops coming into Jordan were removed as far as I'm concerned. So Israel faced the prospect of war on three fronts, from Jordan in the east, from Syria in the north, and from Egypt in the south. That was the time when Auschwitz came up. It never happened before. When people spoke, they said there was a feeling we are surrounded, we are surrounded, no one will help us, no one is helping us. And God forbid if the Arab armies invade us, they'll kill us all. By this point, Israel had been mobilized for more than two weeks. All males aged 18 to 55 were called to serve. Most vehicles were requisitioned. Most factories closed. Israel could not stay fully mobilized for long. But still, Prime Minister Eshkol waited for the international community to do something. He came to military headquarters to remind his generals of America's warning. Israel must not go it alone. He told us that they were making diplomatic efforts in the U.S. and Europe. They were trying to reach a deal with Nasser. It made no sense to us. Flanked by Rabin, Eshkol found himself surrounded by generals insisting on a preemptive strike. General Peled was usually pretty quiet. Now he was shouting. He was actually shrieking. Why do you hesitate? Why are you afraid? I said, Eshko, you have the best army since King David. If you don't attack, you will never be forgiven. If you do, you will be the conquering hero. To regain the confidence of his generals, Prime Minister Eshkol appointed a new Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, hero of the 1956 Suez War. The number of their forces it's bigger than ours, but still, uh, I hope and, uh, that we can make it, but much depends, very much depends, upon where the battle is. The generals also asked for another envoy to be sent to Washington. The prime minister agreed. He said, listen, Mayor, you go to Washington and find out what's going on there. Are the Americans organizing a naval task force? Is anybody going to do anything? When? Amit's mission was to see if the Americans planned to open the Straits of Tehran 
or if Israel would have to act alone. The Pentagon had quite enough trouble in Vietnam and didn't want another war. The director of the CIA made it perfectly clear. There is no international naval force. There are no American plans for action. There is no task force. So the head of the Mossad, Israel's intelligence agency, called on the Secretary of Defense. I said to him, you know our situation. I am here on the instruction of my prime minister. He was doing most of the talking. I did uh, ask one or two questions. At the meeting, I realized that America, because of Vietnam, was unwilling to act alone. And they did not succeed in organizing the international naval force. Also, Eisenhower made a commitment to Israel about the Straits in 1956, so America would no longer oppose Israel acting on its own. I was friendly in, during my discussion and friendly uh, as he left, but uh, he didn't ask for answers, he got no answers. <laughs> Amit raced back to Israel to report to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet not to expect international help. I gave a detailed account of my trip to Washington, and I said, I recommend we launch the war as soon as possible. Not one of the ministers disagreed. We went for our usual walk. Suddenly, Eshkol starts humming. He was completely tone deaf. He had this Hasidic song he liked to sing. He sang it over and over again. The rabbi has told us to enjoy ourselves because hard times are coming. So I asked him, what's happening, dearest? And he told me, tomorrow the war will start. There will be widows, there will be orphans. There will be bereaved parents. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? The generals chose the morning of June 5th for the attack. The chief of staff and I took a decision. On the night of June 4th, we would sleep at home. The tom-toms in Israel work like in the jungle. If the chief of staff and Air Force chief both come home, word gets round that tomorrow is going to be quiet. That was the commander's bedtime message. Leaving behind only 12 fighters to defend Israel, 180 aircraft took off for Egypt. Their target was 45 minutes away. We observed total radio silence. We flew at the height of the waves for about 15 minutes. We flew low over the sand dunes. We crossed the Suez Canal at Kantara and entered the Delta. As we flew over the Delta, farmers waved to us. They probably thought we were Egyptian. Most of the Israeli squadrons flew out to sea far to the west. They had extra fuel tanks to enable them to approach Egypt's air bases from an unexpected direction. That was the longest 45 minutes in my life. The hands on my watch didn't seem to move. They went very slowly. 
As the Israeli bombers approached their targets, the Egyptians received a coded message from Jordan. They spotted Israeli planes heading towards us. So they sent us a signal from their radar base to warn us. The signal was in code. Our codes had changed the day before, and we had real trouble decoding it. The Ministry of Defense asked the air defense people what they had done with the signal they had received. It had the code word, grape. They replied, what signal? At exactly 0745, we pulled up to 6,000 feet. I looked down and saw the MiGs glinting on the edges of the runway. The pilots were sitting inside the cockpits. I knew we had caught them by surprise. The Israelis began their attack by destroying the runways to prevent the Egyptian aircraft from taking off. The few that did get off the ground were no match for the Israeli fighters. I got a call from one of the Air Force chiefs. He said, Nofel, Nofel. I said, yes, sir. He said, our airfields are being attacked. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, our airfields are being attacked. I said, our airfields? He said, the airfields in the Sinai are being attacked. I said, all the Sinai airfields? Tell me it's not true. And he said, believe me, all the airfields are being attacked. I hung up. The phone rang again. It was another commander. He said, we're being attacked. So I said to myself, well, something must be going on. But I was all alone. He was alone because the head of the Egyptian armed forces, Marshal Amer, had left with the Minister of War and his top brass to inspect their positions in the Sinai. Ten minutes after takeoff, we heard about the Israeli attack. We turned round and flew back. Our cars had gone. We had to hail a taxi to get back to headquarters. By the time Marshal Amer's taxi got him back to headquarters, Egypt's air force was destroyed. Marshal Amer was panicked. He told the air force chief to implement the counterattack plan. The air force chief replied, "How can I? I have no aircraft." In the Sinai, Egypt had three times as many tanks as Israel, but with no air cover, their situation was dire. Marshal Amer told me, draw up a plan of retreat. Bring the troops back across the canal. Marshal Amer had been a close friend of President Nasser for more than 20 years. They had fought together as young officers. Together, they had planned the coup which brought down the Egyptian monarchy. Now the defeated president phoned his defeated army commander. I was the only other person there. Amer was in tears. He was calling Nasser by his first name. He said, let me bring our boys back safely, Gamal. When he put the phone down, I asked, why are you crying? He told me Nasser had said, forgive me, Hakim, I caused this catastrophe. Forgive me, Hakim. Abdul Nasser had been crying, too. Marshal Amer didn't wait for his chief of staff to plan a retreat. He simply picked up the phone and gave the order himself. The order was, withdraw back across the canal. 
leave the artillery behind. Marshal Amer's order was a disaster. With no plan, his retreating units could not protect each other. The Israelis gave chase. Our tanks had Egyptian tanks in front and behind them. We attacked them from the ground and from the air. Thousands were destroyed. They were all burning. It was a terrible sight. Three hundred thirty-eight Israelis were killed. But the Egyptian dead numbered fifteen thousand. Days earlier, when the war had begun, the Israelis had contacted the King of Jordan. We did not plan to take Jerusalem or the West Bank. We did not plan to take the Golan. On the 5th, we sent a telegram through the Americans to King Hussein, telling him that the war was between us and the Egyptians. If Jordan stayed out, nothing would happen. But at about 10.30, he started shelling Jerusalem. Teddy Kolak, the mayor of Jerusalem, asked me at the command post what he should do with the children in the kindergartens and schools. In the command post, we looked at each other. We said, this is not nice. We'll take on Hussein. The deputy chief of staff called me. He said, Uzi, you are authorized to enter the old city. You have to be quick and use your head. It took the Israelis 10 hours of bitter street fighting to defeat the Jordan Legion soldiers defending the old city. Once the troops had broken through to the Wailing Wall, keeping the city united under Israel's rule became the basic goal of the government. When the battle ended, Jordan had lost not only the old city, but all the land on the west bank of the Jordan River. I went out to the front and I could see people crossing over in uh, small groups, very tired. You know, all the years that I had spent since 1953 trying to build that country and build that army, all the pride, all the hopes, uh, I saw it just destroyed. I never received a more crushing blow than that. Mr. Prime Minister, does Israel wish any territory beyond the territory she now holds? No, sir. No, sir. We don't need any additional territory. Uh, we want only to develop this territory that we have. There is so much to put in energy and, and money and, 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 and brain that we have a little, a little, a little. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, want any additional territory. With Jordan and Egypt defeated, Israel turned its might on the Golan Heights, the site of frequent attacks from Syria. Diane said, we're going to take the Golan now. I remember that some ministers from the religious parties were opposed to this. Diane was adamant. He said, we're not going to lose time. I've delayed it this long because we wanted to finish with the Egyptians and Jordanians. We threw everything we had at the Golan Heights. 
In 12 hours, we dropped more bombs on the Golan than we had on all the Egyptian airfields. Rockets, bombs, napalm, everything we had. The whole war had been sparked by a false Soviet report of a threat to Syria. Now that Israel was actually attacking Syria, the Soviets were forced to react. Word came through, the hotline was up, and I didn't know what it was about because I, I thought that the war was pretty well over. Nevertheless, I went back immediately to the White House. The usual suspects were there, McNamara and, and the rest. And we had a, a rather hairy message from the Russians. The Soviets made very clear they would intervene militarily. And very likely they would not only turn Israel back from its attack on Syria, but they would join Syria in an effort to, uh, to deal a mortal blow to Israel. It was a very, very dangerous situation. The Soviets did not seem to be bluffing. Strategic Bomber Command in the Ukraine had received orders to prepare four squadrons to fly to the battle zone. It was all arranged in a great hurry. We were given strict instructions not to suffer any casualties. The loss of even one Soviet aircraft would betray our involvement. But we saw this was unrealistic, so we had to find another way. The pilots were then ordered to leave behind all identification. Their planes were to be repainted in Egyptian colors. Our red stars are only one color, red. But it turned out that now we needed four different colors. I remember green and black and something else, maybe red. But we didn't have the right colors. So that caused a lot of fuss. In the White House Situation Room, President Johnson and his staff worked out their response to the Soviet ultimatum. The president sent a message over the hotline telling the Kremlin that he was using every means to get the Israelis to stop the war. This was not strictly true. Although he could have phoned the Israeli prime minister directly, he phoned the Israeli ambassador to the UN instead. United States Ambassador Goldbeck asked me to come out into the lobby and to send to say to me, you must immediately, immediately announce that the fighting is over. This was not within the Israeli ambassador's power, so he asked his boss, Abba Ibn, to phone the prime minister. But Eshkol was with his generals on the Golan Heights. Suddenly, Abba Ibn calls and says, tell Eshkol to stop the war. We're under terrible pressure here at the United Nations. Then Eshkol calls me and he says, ah, this Golan is absolutely fantastic. The view is wonderful. He waxes lyrical about it. And I tell him, Eshkol, listen, Iban wants you to stop the war. He can't take the pressure. He said, I can't hear you. What do you mean you can't hear me? I'm telling you in Iban's exact words. He says, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. It's a bad line. It's a bad line. I'll come home and then we'll talk. And then I understood. They wanted time to conquer some more kilometers. The Israelis pressed on into the Golan and encountered no Soviet forces because President Johnson had raised the stakes. He asked McNamara what distance from the Syrian coast the fleet, American fleet, was at the time, and he said 100 miles. It was steaming toward, uh, toward Gibraltar on a training exercise. We turned it around. And the president said, move them to within 50 miles. Knowing that the fleet was shadowed by Soviet electronic ships and they would know it directly. 
So our secret invasion by the back door never happened. Thank God for that. The Israeli government waited until their forces had achieved their objective before giving the order to halt. A colleague of mine from foreign ministry in Jerusalem called me to give me the text of an agreed statement on ceasefire. Israel accepts any proposal made by General Bull for the implementation of the Security Council ceasefire resolution and the arrangements for the supervision of the ceasefire. I read this, this statement, slowly translating it from Hebrew into English, and that was the end of the war. In six days, the armed forces had quadrupled the territory Israel controlled. From Syria, they had taken the Golan Heights. From Jordan, the West Bank and the old city of Jerusalem. From Egypt, Gaza and the Sinai. With so much land to trade, Israel had its best chance ever for peace. Israelis flocked to the old city. To them, the victory was a deliverance from destruction. The Israeli cabinet was determined to hold on to Jerusalem and for the time being, the West Bank. But in exchange for peace, they were willing to give back the Golan Heights to Syria and the Sinai Desert to Egypt. The foreign minister told the Americans of Israel's offer. When I presented these to a meeting headed by uh, Dean Rusk and Goldberg and Cisco, uh, in general they were astonished by the fact that we were clearly not in the mood of annexation. That was, uh, uh, we believed then, um, a rather remarkable initiative on the part uh, of the Israelis because we were operating on the assumption Eban had told us some days before we are not interested in territory that week president johnson was hosting a summit for soviet prime minister kosygin eager to appear as peacemakers at the un the two leaders had a peace resolution drafted in cairo it was scrutinized by the foreign ministry this was another turning point in the Arab-Israeli conflict. We concluded that this proposal was the best we were likely to get. We advised the foreign minister to accept it. The minister looked at it differently. When the resolution was proposed, Israel was ready to accept it. But Egypt's foreign minister was utterly against the resolution, because it indirectly implied Israel's right to exist, and he wouldn't have that at all. Israel, of course, did not want any resolution that only said, pull back your forces, but didn't recognize Israel's existence. So this was the problem. But recognizing Israel was not on Nasser's agenda. Following Egypt's defeat, he had more immediate problems at home. Abdul Nasser said, we've lost. There is no point in staying on. I shall resign. I have decided to resign totally and finally from all official positions. I shall return to private life. I shall perform my duties like any other citizen. After his broadcast, crowds surrounded the presidential palace and begged Nasser to stay. Most of the demonstrations were genuine. People really were upset. 
But something else happened too. The party boss told members to gather and listen to the speech. After the speech, they took to the streets and chanted, We want Nasser, no leader but Nasser. Nasser stayed on as president. His old friend, Marshal Amer, became the scapegoat. He refused to resign, so Nasser had him arrested. He died in custody. It was said in Cairo he was suicided. Shortly after, Nasser rejected the Soviet-American peace plan. Nasser could not bring himself to accept the peace plan. He was a hero to the Arabs. He couldn't be seen negotiating with the Israelis. Three months later, Arab leaders met to formulate a unified policy towards Israel. Nasser, still the idol of the Arab world, was subdued. I found him a different man. I noticed from the outset that uh, he felt uh, a great sense of guilt. The Arabs agreed to reject any compromise with Israel. The decision by the Arab countries uh, not to negotiate with Israel, uh, not to make peace with Israel, and uh, not to recognize uh, Israel. With no recognition, no negotiation, and no peace, it was only a matter of time before war would break out again.